Section 11 of the Works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine in Oslo, Norway. The Works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition, Volume 1. The Murders in the Rue Morgue. Part 1. What song the siren sang, or what name Achilles assumed when he hid himself among women, although puzzling questions, are not beyond all conjecture. Sir Thomas Brown. The mental features discoursed of as the analytical are, in themselves, but little susceptible of analysis. We appreciate them only in their efforts. We know of them, among other things, that they are always to their possessor, when inordinately possessed, a source of the liveliest enjoyment. As the strong man exults in his physical ability, delighting in such exercises as call his muscles into action, so glories the analyst in that moral activity which disentangles. He derives pleasure from even the most trivial occupations, bringing his talent into play. He is fond of enigmas, of conundrums, of hieroglyphics, exhibiting in his solutions of each a degree of acumen which appears to the ordinary apprehension prenatural. His results, brought about by the very soul and essence of method, have, in truth, the whole air of intuition. The faculty of resolution is possibly much invigorated by mathematical study and especially by that highest branch of it which, unjustly and merely on account of its retrograde operations, has been called, as if par excellence, analysis. Yet to calculate is not in itself to analyze. A chess player, for example, does the one without effort at the other. It follows that the game of chess, in its effects upon mental character, is greatly misunderstood. I am not now writing a treatise, but simply prefacing a somewhat peculiar narrative by observations very much at random. I will, therefore, take occasion to assert that the higher powers of the reflective intellect are more decidedly and more usefully tasked by the unostentatious game of draught than by the elaborate frivolity of chess. In this latter, where the pieces have different and bizarre motions, with various and variable values. What is only complex is mistaken, a not unusual error, for what is profound. The attention is here called powerfully into play. If it flag for an instant, an oversight is committed resulting in injury or defeat. The possible moves being not only manifold but involute, the chances of such oversight are multiplied, and in nine cases out of ten, it is the more concentrative rather than the more acute player who conquers. In draught, on the contrary, where the moves are unique and have but little variation, the probabilities of inadvertence are diminished, and a mere attention being left comparatively unemployed, what advantages are obtained by either party are obtained by superior acumen. To be less abstract, let us suppose a game of draught where the pieces are reduced to four kings, and where, of course, no oversight is to be expected. It is obvious that here the victory can be decided, the players being at all equal, only by some recherche movement, the results of some strong exertion of the intellect. Deprived of ordinary resources, the analyst throws himself into the spirit of his opponent, identifies himself therewith, and not unfrequently sees thus, at a glance, the sole methods, sometimes indeed absurdly simple ones, by which he may seduce into error or hurry into miscalculation, which has long been noted for its influence upon what is termed the calculating power, and men of the highest order of intellect have been known to take an apparently unaccountable delight in it, while eschewing chess as frivolous. Beyond doubt, there is nothing of a similar nature so greatly tasking the faculty of analysis. The best chess player in Christendom may be little more than the best player of chess. 
but proficiency in which implies capacity for success in all those more important undertakings where mind struggles with mind. When I say proficiency, I mean that perfection in the game which includes a comprehension of all the sources whence legitimate advantage may be derived. These are not only manifold but multiform, and lie frequently among recesses of thought altogether inaccessible to the ordinary understanding. To observe attentively is to remember distinctly, and, so far, the concentrative chess player will do very well at whist, while the rules of Hoyle, themselves based upon the mere mechanism of the game, are sufficiently and generally comprehensible. Thus to have a retentive memory, and to proceed by the book, are points commonly regarded as the sum total of good playing. But it is in the matters beyond the limits of mere rule that the skill of the analyst is evinced. He makes, in silence, a host of observations and inferences. So, perhaps, do his companions, and the difference in the extent of the information obtained lies not so much in the validity of the inference as in the quality of the observation. The necessary knowledge is that of what to observe. A player confines himself not at all, nor, because the game is the object, does he reject deductions from things external to the game. He examines the countenance of his partner, comparing it carefully with that of each of his opponents. He considers the modes of assorting the cards in each hand, often counting trump by trump, and honour by honour, through the glances bestowed by their holders upon each. He notes every variation of face as the play progresses, gathering a fund of thought from the differences in expression of certainty, of surprise, of triumph, or of chagrin. From the manner of gathering up a trick, he judges whether the person taking it can make another in the suit. He recognizes what is played through feint, by the air with which it is thrown upon the table. A casual or inadvertent word, the accidental dropping or turning of a card, with accompanying anxiety and carelessness in regard to its concealment, the counting of the tricks, with the order of the arrangements, embarrassment, hesitation, eagerness, or trepidation, all afford, to his apparently intuitive perception, indications of the true state of affairs. The first two or three rounds having been played, he is in full possession of the contents of each hand, and thenceforward puts down his cards, with as absolute precision of purpose as if the rest of the party had turned outward the faces of their own. The analytical power should not be confounded with ample ingenuity. For while the analyst is necessarily ingenious, the ingenious man is often remarkably incapable of analysis. The constructive or combining power, by which ingenuity is usually manifested, and to which the phrenologists, I believe erroneously, have assigned a separate organ, supposing it a primitive faculty, has been so frequently seen in those whose intellect bordered otherwise upon idiocy, as to have attracted general observation among writers on morals. Between ingenuity and the analytic ability there exists a difference far greater, indeed, than that between the fancy and the imagination, but of a character very strictly analogous. It will be found, in fact, that the ingenious are always fanciful, and the truly imaginative never otherwise than analytic. The narrative which follows will appear to the reader somewhat in the light of a commentary upon the propositions just advanced. Residing in Paris during the spring and part of the summer of eighteen, I there became acquainted with a Monsieur C. Auguste Dupont. This young gentleman was of excellent, indeed of an illustrious family, but, by a variety of untoward events, had been reduced to such poverty that the energy of his character succumbed beneath it, and he ceased to bestir himself in the world, or to care for the retrieval of his fortunes. By courtesy of his creditors there still remained in his possession a small remnant of his patrimony, and, upon the income arising from this, he managed, by means of rigorous economy, to procure the necessaries of life, without troubling himself about its superfluities. Books, indeed, were his sole luxuries, and in Paris these are easily obtained. 
Our first meeting was at an obscure library in the Rue Montmartre, where the accident of our both being in search of the same very rare and very remarkable volume brought us into closer communion. We saw each other again and again. I was deeply interested in the little family history which he had detailed to me, with all that candor which a Frenchman indulges whenever mere self is his theme. I was astonished, too, at the vast extent of his reading, and, above all, I felt my soul enkindled within me by the wild fervor and the vivid freshness of his imagination. Seeking in Paris the objects I then sought, I felt that the society of such a man would be to me a treasure beyond price, and this feeling I frankly confided to him. It was at length arranged that we should live together during my stay in the city, and as my worldly circumstances were somewhat less embarrassed than his own, I was permitted to be at the expense of renting and furnishing in a style which suited the rather fantastic gloom of our common temper, a time-eaten and grotesque mansion, long deserted through superstitions, into which we did not inquire, and tottering to its fall in a retired and desolate portion of the Faubourg Saint-Germain. Had the routine of our life at this place been known to the world, we should have been regarded as madmen, although, perhaps, as madmen of a harmless nature. Our seclusion was perfect. We admitted no visitors. Indeed, the locality of our retirement had been carefully kept a secret from my own former associates, and it had been many years since Dupois had ceased to know or be known in Paris. We existed within ourselves alone. It was a freak of fancy in my friend, for what else shall I call it, to be enamoured of the night for her own sake, and into this bizarre as into all of his others, I quietly fell, giving myself up to his wild whims with a perfect abandon. The sable divinity would not herself dwell with us always, but we could counterfeit her presence. At the first dawn of the morning, we closed all the messy shutters of our old building, lighting a couple of tapers which, strongly perfumed, threw out only the ghastliest and feeblest of rays. By the aid of these, we then busied our souls in dreams, reading, writing, or conversing, until worn by the clock of the advent of the true darkness. Then we sallied forth into the street arm in arm, continuing the topics of the day, or roaming far and wide, until a late hour, seeking, amid the wild lights and shadows of the populous city, that infinity of mental excitement which quiet observation can afford. At such times I could not help remarking and admiring, although from his rich ideality I had been prepared to expect it, a peculiar analytic ability in Dubois. He seemed, too, to take an eager delight in its exercise, if not exactly in its display, and did not hesitate to confess the pleasure thus derived. He boasted to me, with a low chuckling laugh, that most men, in respect to himself, wore windows in their bosoms, and was wont to follow up such assertion by direct and very startling proofs of his intimate knowledge of my own. His manner at these moments was frigid and abstract. His eyes were awakened in expression, while his voice, usually a rich tenor, rose into a treble which would have sounded petulantly, but for the deliberateness and entire distinctness of the annunciation. Observing him in these moods, I often dwelt meditatively upon the old philosophy of the bipart soul, and amused myself with the fancy of a double Dupin, the creative and the resolvent. Let it not be supposed from what I have just said, that I am detailing any mystery, or penning any romance. What I have described in the Frenchman was merely the result of an excited, or perhaps of a diseased intelligence. But of the character of his remarks at the periods in question an example would best convey the idea. We were strolling one night down a long dirty street in the vicinity of the Palais Royal, being both apparently occupied with thought, neither of us had spoken a syllable for fifteen minutes at least. All at once Dupois broke forth with these words. He is a very little fellow, that's true, and would do better for the Théâtre de Variété. There can be no doubt of that, 
I replied unwittingly, and not at first observing, so much had I been absorbed in reflection, the extraordinary manner in which the speaker had chimed in with my meditations. In an instant afterward I recollected myself, and my astonishment was profound. "'Du point,' I said gravely, "'this is beyond my comprehension. I do not hesitate to say that I am amazed, and can scarcely credit my senses. How is it possible you should know I was thinking of—' Here I paused, to ascertain beyond a doubt whether he really knew of whom I thought. "'Of Chantilly,' said he. "'Why do you pause? You were remarking to yourself that his diminutive figure unfitted him for tragedy. This was precisely what had formed the subject of my reflections. Chantilly was a quondam cobbler of the Rue Saint-Denis, who, becoming a stage-man, had attempted the role of Xerxes in Crebillion's tragedy, so-called, and been notoriously pasquinated for his pains. "'Tell me, for heaven's sake,' I exclaimed, "'the method, if method there is, by which you have been enabled to fathom my soul in this matter.' In fact, I was even more startled than I would have been willing to express. "'It was the fruitier,' replied my friend, "'who brought you to the conclusion that the mender of souls was not of sufficient height for Xerxes, et ic genus omna.' "'The fruitier! You astonish me! I know no fruitier whomsoever!' "'The man, who ran up against you as we entered the street. It may have been fifteen minutes ago.' "'I now remember that, in fact, a fruitier carrying upon his head a large basket of apples had nearly thrown me down by accident as we passed from the Rue C into the thoroughfare where we stood. But what this had to do with Chantilly I could not possibly understand.' There was not a particle of charlanterie about Dupont. I will explain, he said. And that you may comprehend all clearly, we will first retrace the course of your meditation, from the moment in which I spoke to you, until that of the rencontre with the fruitier in question. The larger links of the chain run thus. Chantilly, Orion, Dr. Nichols, Epicurus, Stereotomy, the Street Stones, the fruitier. There are few persons who have not, at some period of their lives, amused themselves in retracing the steps by which particular conclusions of their own minds have been attained. The occupation is often full of interests, and he who attempts it for the first time is astonished by the apparent limited distance and incoherence between the starting point and the goal. What, then, must have been my amazement when I heard the Frenchman speak what he had just spoken? and when I could not help acknowledging that he had spoken the truth. He continued, We had been talking of horses, if I remember all right, just before leaving the Rue C. This was the last subject we discussed. As we crossed into the street, a fruitier, with a large basket upon his head, brushing quickly past us, thrust you upon a pile of paving stones collected at a spot where the causeway is undergoing repair. You stepped upon one of the loose fragments, slipped, slightly strained your ankle, appeared vexed or sulky, muttered a few words, turned to look at the pile, and then proceeded in silence. I was not particularly attentive to what you did, but observation has become with me, of late, a species of necessity. You kept your eyes upon the ground, glancing, with a petulant expression, at the holes and ruts in the pavement, so that I saw you were still thinking of the stones until we reached the little alley called La Martine, which has been paved, by the way of experiment, with the overlapping and riveted blocks. Here your countenance brightened up, and, perceiving your lips move, I could not doubt that you murmured the word stereotomy, a term very effectively applied to this species of payment. I knew that you could not say to yourself stereotomy without being brought to think of atomies, and thus the theories of Epicurus. And since, when we discussed this subject not very long ago, I mentioned to you how singularly, yet with how little notice, the vague guesses of that noble Greek had met with confirmation in the late nebula Cosmogony, I felt that you could not yet avoid casting your eyes upward to the great nebula in Orion, and I certainly expected that you would do so. You did look up, and I was now assured that I had correctly followed your steps. 
but in that bitter tirade upon Chantilly, which appeared in yesterday's Musée, the Sartarist, making some disgraceful allusions to the cobbler's change of name, upon assuming the buskin, quoted a Latin line about which we have often conversed. I mean the line, Perditit antiquum litera sonum. I had told you that this was the reference to Orion, formerly written Urian, and, from certain pungencies, Connected with this explanation, I was aware that you could not have forgotten it. It was clear, therefore, that you would not fail to combine the two ideas of Orion and Chantilly. That you did combine them, I saw but the character of the smile which passed over your lips. You thought of the poor cobbler's immolation. So far, you had been stooping in your gait, but now I saw you draw yourself up to your full height. I was then sure that you reflected upon the diminutive figure of Chantilly. At this point I interrupted your meditations to remark that as, in fact, it was a very little fellow, that Chantilly, he would do better at the Theatre de Varité. Not long after this, we were looking over an evening edition of the Gazette de Trébagneux when the following paragraphs arrested our attention. Extraordinary Murders this morning, about three o'clock, the inhabitants of the Quartier saint roch were aroused from sleep by a succession of terrific shrieks issuing, apparently, from the fourth story of a house in the Rue Morgue, known to be in the sole occupancy of one Madame L'Espanier and her daughter Mademoiselle Camille L'Espanier. After some delay, occasioned by a fruitless attempt to procure admission in the usual manner, the gateway was broken in with a crowbar and eight or ten of the neighbors entered accompanied by two gendarmes. By this time the cries had ceased, but, as the party rushed up the first flight of stairs, two or more rough voices in angry contention were distinguished and seemed to proceed from the upper part of the house. As the second landing was reached, these sounds, also, had ceased and everything remained perfectly quiet. The party spread themselves and hurried from room to room, Upon arriving at a large back chamber in the fourth story, the door of which, being found locked, with the key inside, was forced open, a spectacle presented itself which struck every one present not less with horror than with astonishment. The apartment was in the wildest disorder, the furniture broken and thrown about in all directions. There was only one bedstead, and from this the bed had been removed and thrown into the middle of the floor. On a chair lay a razor besmeared with blood. On the heart were two or three long and thick tresses of grey human hair, also dabbled in blood, and seeming to have been pulled out by the roots. Upon the floor were found four napoleons, an airing of topaz, three large silver spoons, three smaller of metal d'olcher, and two bags containing nearly four thousand francs in gold. The drawers of a bureau, which stood in one corner, were open and had been, apparently, rifled, although many articles still remained in them. A small iron safe was discovered under the bed, not under the bedstead. It was open, with the key still in the door. It had no contents beyond a few old letters and other papers of little consequence. Of Madame L'Espanier no traces were here seen but an unusual quantity of soot being observed in the fireplace, a search was made in the chimney, and, horrible to relate, the corpse of the daughter, head downward, was dragged therefrom, it having been thus forced up the narrow aperture for a considerable distance. The body was quite warm. Upon examining it, many exorcations were perceived, no doubt occasioned by the violence with which it had been thrust up and disengaged. Upon the face were many severe scratches, and, upon the throat, dark bruises and deep indentations of fingernails, as if the deceased had been throttled to death. After a thorough investigation of every portion of the house, without farther discovery, the party made its way into a small paved yard in the rear of the building, where lay the corpse of the old lady, with her throat so entirely cut that, upon an attempt to raise her, the head fell off. The body, as well as the head, was fearfully mutilated, the former so much so as scarcely to retain any semblance of humanity. 
To this horrible mystery there is not as yet, we believe, the slightest clue. The next day's paper had these additional particulars. The tragedy in Rue Morgue. Many individuals have been examined in relation to this most extraordinary and frightful affair. The word affair has not yet in France that levity of import which it conveys with us. But nothing whatever has transpired to throw light upon it. We give below all the material testimony elicited. Pauline Dubourg, laundress, deposes that she has known both the deceased for three years, having washed for them during that period. The old lady and her daughter seem on good terms, very affectionate towards each other. They were excellent pay, could not speak in regard to their mode or means of living, believed that Madame L'Espanier told fortunes for a living, was reputed to have money put by, never met any persons in the house when she called for the clothes or took them home, was sure they had no servant in employ. There appeared to be no furniture in any part of the building except in the fourth story. Pierre Mourat, tobacconist, deposes that he has been in the habit of selling small quantities of tobacco and snuff to Madame L'Espanier for nearly four years, was born in the neighborhood, and has always resided there. The deceased and her daughter had occupied the house in which the corpses were found for more than six years. It was formerly occupied by a jeweller, who underlet its upper rooms to various persons. The house was the property of Madame L'Espanier. She became dissatisfied with the abuse of the premises by her tenant, and moved into them herself, refusing to let any portion. The old lady was childish. Witness had seen the daughter some five or six times during the six years. The two lived an exceedingly retired life were reputed to have money, had heard it said among the neighbors that Madame L'Espanier told fortunes, did not believe it, had never seen any person enter the door except the old lady and her daughter, a porter once or twice, and a physician some eight or ten times. Many other persons, neighbors, gave evidence to the same effect. No one was spoken of as frequenting the house. It was not known whether there were any living connections of Madame L'Espanier and her daughter. The shutters of the front windows were seldom opened. Those in the rear were always closed, with the exception of the large back room fourth story. The house was a good house, not very old. Isidore Musset, gendarme, disposes that he was called to the house about three o'clock in the morning, and found some twenty or thirty persons at the gateway, endeavoring to gain admittance. Forced it open at length, with a bayonet, not with a crowbar, had but little difficulty in getting it open on account of its being a double folding gate, and bolted neither at bottom nor top. The shrieks were continued until the gate was forced, and then suddenly ceased. They seemed to be screams of some person or persons in great agony, were loud and drawn out, not short and quick. Witness led the way upstairs. Upon reaching the first landing, heard two voices in loud and angry contention, the one a gruff voice, the other much shriller, a very strange voice. Could distinguish some words of the former, which was that of a Frenchman. Was positive that it was not a woman's voice. Could distinguish the words sacre and diable. The shrill voice was that of a foreigner. Could not be sure whether it was the voice of a man or of a woman could not make out what was said, but believed the language to be Spanish. The state of the room and of the bodies was described by this witness as we described them yesterday. Henri Duval, a neighbor, and by trade a silversmith, deposes that he was one of the party who first entered the house, corroborates the testimony of Musset in general. As soon as they forced an entrance, they reclosed the door to keep out the crowd, which collected very fast, notwithstanding the lateness of the hour. The shrill voice this witness thinks was that of an Italian. Was certain it was not French. Could not be sure that it was a man's voice. It might have been a woman's. Was not acquainted with the Italian language. Could not distinguish the words, but was convinced by the intonation that the speaker was an Italian. 
knew Madame L'Espanier and her daughter, had conversed with both frequently, was sure that the shrill voice was not that of either of the deceased. Odenheimer, restaurateur. This witness volunteered his testimony. Not speaking French, was examined through an interpreter, is a native of Amsterdam, was passing the house at the time of the shrieks. They lasted for several minutes, probably ten. They were long and loud, very awful and distressing. Was one of those who entered the building, corroborated the previous evidence in every respect but one, was sure that the shrill voice was that of a man, of a Frenchman, could not distinguish the words uttered. They were loud and quick, unequal, spoken apparently in fear as well as in anger. The voice was harsh, not so much shrill as harsh. Could not call it a shrill voice. The gruff voice said repeatedly, Sacre, diable, and once, Mon Dieu. Jules Mignot, banker of the firm of Mignot et Fille, Rue de Lorraine, is the elder Mignot. Madame L'Espanier had some property, had opened an account with his banking house in the spring of the year, eight years previously, made frequent deposits in small sums, had checked for nothing until the third day before her death, when she took out in person the sum of four thousand francs. This sum was paid in gold, and a clerk went home with the money. Adolphe Lebon, clerk to Mignot de Fille, the supposes that on the day in question, about noon, he accompanied Madame L'Espanier to her residence with the four thousand francs, put up in two bags. Upon the door being opened, Mademoiselle L'Espanier appeared and took from his hands one of the bags, while the old lady relieved him of the other. He then bowed and departed, did not see any person in the street at the time. It is a by-street, very lonely. William Bird, tailor, deposes that he was one of the party who entered the house, is an Englishman, has lived in Paris two years, was one of the first to ascend the stairs, heard the voices in contation. The gruff voice was that of a Frenchman, could make out several words but cannot now remember all, heard distinctly sacre and mon dieu. There was a sound at the moment as if of several persons struggling a scraping and scruffling sound. The shrill voice was very loud, louder than the gruff one, is sure that it was not the voice of an Englishman, appeared to be that of a German, might have been a woman's voice, does not understand German. Four of the above-named witnesses, being recalled, deposes that the door of the chamber in which was found the body of Mademoiselle L'Espanier was locked in on the inside when the party reached it. Everything was perfectly silent, no groans or noises of any kind. Upon forcing the door, no person was seen. The windows, both of the back and front room, were down and firmly fastened from within. A door between the two rooms was closed, but not locked. The door leading from the front room into the passage was locked, with the key on the inside. A small room in the front of the house, on the fourth story, at the head of the passage was open, the door being ajar. This room was crowded with old beds, boxes, and so forth. These were carefully removed and searched. There was not an inch of any portion of the house which was not carefully searched. Sweeps were sent up and down the chimneys. The house was a four-story one, with garrets, mansards. A trap-door on the roof was nailed down very securely did not appear to have been opened for years. The time elapsing between hearing of the voices in contentation and the breaking open of the room door was variously stated by the witnesses. Some made it as short as three minutes, some as long as five. The door was opened with difficulty. Alfonso Garcio, undertaker, disposes that he resides in the Rue Morgue, is a native of Spain, was one of the party who entered the house, did not proceed upstairs, is nervous and was apprehensive of the consequences of agitation, heard the voices in contention, the gruff voice was that of a Frenchman, could not distinguish what was said, the shrill voice was that of an Englishman, is sure of this, does not understand the English language, 
but judges by the intonation. Alberto Montani, confectioner, deposes that he was among the first to ascend the stairs. Heard the voices in question. The gruff voice was that of a Frenchman. Distinguished several words. The speaker appeared to be expostulating. Could not make out words of the shrill voice. Spoke quick and unevenly. Think it the voice of a Russian. Corroborates the general testimony. Is an Italian. Never conversed with a native of Russia. Several witnesses recalled here testify that the chimneys of all the rooms on the fourth story were too narrow to admit the passage of a human being. By sweeps were meant cylindrical sweeping brushes, such as are employed by those who clean chimneys. These brushes were passed up and down every flue in the house. There is no back passage by which any one could have descended while the party proceeded upstairs. The body of Mademoiselle L'Espanier was so firmly wedged in the chimney that it could not be got down until four or five of the party united their strength. Paul de Mar, physician, deposes that he was called to view the bodies about daybreak. They were both then lying on the sacking of the bedstead in the chamber where Mademoiselle L'Espanier was found. The corpse of the young lady was much bruised and excoriated. The fact that it had been thrust up the chimney would sufficiently account for these appearances. The throat was greatly chuffed. There were several deep scratches just below the chin, together with a series of livid spots which were evidently the impression of fingers. The face was fearfully discoloured, and the eyeballs protruded. The tongue had been partially bitten through. A large bruise was discovered upon the pit of the stomach, produced apparently by the pressure of a knee. In the opinion of Monsieur Dumas, Mademoiselle L'Espanier had been throttled to death by some person or persons unknown. The corpse of the mother was horribly mutilated. All the bones of the right leg and arm were more or less shattered. The left tibia much splintered, as well as all the ribs of the left side. Whole body dreadfully bruised and discoloured. It was not possible to say how the injuries had been inflicted. A heavy club of wood or a broad bar of iron, a chair, any large, heavy, and obtuse weapon would have been produced such results, if wielded by the hands of a very powerful man. No woman could have inflicted the blows with any weapon. The head of the deceased, when seen by a witness, was entirely separated from the body, and was also greatly shattered. The throat had evidently been cut with some very sharp instrument probably with a razor. Alexander Etienne, surgeon, was called with Monsieur Dumas to view the bodies, corroborated the testimony and the opinions of Monsieur Dumas. Nothing farther of importance was elicited, although several other persons were examined. A murder so mysterious and so perplexing in all its particulars was never before committed in Paris, if indeed a murder has been committed at all. The police are entirely at fault, an unusual occurrence in affairs of this nature. There is not, however, the shadow of a clue apparent. The evening edition of the paper stated that the greatest excitement still continued in the Quartier saint Roche, that the premises in question had been carefully researched and fresh examinations of the witnesses instituted, but all to no purpose. A postscript, however, mentioned that Adolphe Le Bon had been arrested and imprisoned, although nothing appeared to incriminate him beyond the facts already detailed. Dupois seemed singularly interested in the progress of this affair. At least so I judged from his manner, for he made no comments. It was only after the announcement that Le Bon had been imprisoned that he asked me my opinion respecting the murders. I could merely agree with all Paris in considering them an insoluble mystery. I saw no means by which it would be possible to trace the murderer. We must not judge of the means, said Dupont, by this shell of an examination. The Parisian police, so much extolled for acumen, are cunning, but no more. There is no method in their proceedings beyond the method of the moment. 
they make a vast parade of meshes, but, not unfrequently, these are so ill-adapted to the objects proposed as to put us in mind of Monsieur Chaudin's calling for his robe de chambre, pour mieux entendre à la musique. The results attained by them are not unfrequently surprising, but, for the most part, are brought about by simple diligence and activity. When these qualities are unavailing, their schemes fail. Vidyoc, for example, was a good guesser and a persevering man, but, without educated thought, he erred continually by the very intensity of his investigations. He impaired his vision by holding the object too close. He might see, perhaps, one or two points with unusual clearness, but in doing so he, necessarily, lost sight of the matter as a whole. Thus, there is such a thing as being too profound. Truth is not always in a well. In fact, as regards the more important knowledge, I do believe that she is invariably superficial. The depth lies in the valleys where we seek her, and not upon the mountain tops where she is found. The modes and sources of this kind of error are well typified in the contemplation of the heavenly bodies. To look at a star by glances, to view it in a sidelong way by turning toward it the exterior proportions of the retina, more susceptible of feeble impressions of light than the interior, is to behold the star distinctly, is to have the best appreciation of its lustre, a lustre which grows dim just in proportion as we turn our vision fully upon it. A greater number of rays actually fall upon the eye of the latter case, but, in the former, there is the more refined capacity for comprehension. By undue profundity we perplex an enfeeble thought, and it is possible to make even Venus herself vanish from the firmament by a scrutiny too sustained, too concentrated, or too direct. As for these murders, let us enter into some examination for ourselves before we make up an opinion respecting them. An inquiry will afford us amusement. I thought this an odd term, so applied, but said nothing. And, besides, Le Bon once rendered me a service for which I am not ungrateful. We will go and see the premises, with our own eyes. I know G, the prefect of the police, and shall have no difficulty in obtaining the necessary permission. The permission was obtained, and we proceeded at once to Rue Morgue. This is one of those miserable thoroughfares which intervene between the Rue Richelieu and the Rue Saint Roche. It was late in the afternoon when we reached it, as this quarter is a great distance from that in which we resided. The house was readily found, for there were still many persons gazing up at the closed shutters with an objectless curiosity from the opposite side of the way. It was an ordinary Parisian house with a gateway, on one side of which was a glazed watch-box, with a sliding panel in the window, indicating a loger de concierge. Before going in, we walked up the street, turned down an alley, and then, again, turning, passed in the rear of the building. Dupois, meanwhile examining the whole neighborhood, as well as the house, with a minuteness of attention for which I could see no possible object. Retracing our steps, we came again to the front of the dwelling, rang, and having shown our credentials, were admitted by the agents in charge. We went upstairs, into the chamber where the body of Mademoiselle L'Espanier had been found, and where both the deceased still lay. The disorders of the room had, as usual, been suffered to exist. I saw nothing beyond what had been stated in the Gazette de Trebonnet. Dupont scrutinized everything not excepting the bodies of the victims. We then went into the other rooms, and into the yard, a gendarmerie accompanying us throughout. The examination occupied us until dark, when we took our departure. On our way home, my companion stepped in for a moment at the office of one of the daily papers. I have said that the whims of my friend were manifold, and that Cholet Ménager, for this phrase there is no English equivalent. It was his humour now to decline all conversation on the subject of the murder until about noon the next day. He then asked me, suddenly, if I had observed anything peculiar at the scene of the atrocity. There was something in his manner of emphasising the word peculiar 
which caused me to shudder, without knowing why. No, nothing peculiar, I said. Nothing more, at least, than we both saw stated in the paper. The Gazette, he replied, has not entered, I fear, into the unusual horror of the thing, but dismissed the idle opinions of this print. It appears to me that this mystery is considered insoluble for the very reason which should cause it to be regarded as easy of solution. I mean for the outre character of its features. The police are confounded by the seeming absence of motive, not for the murder itself, but for the atrocity of the murder. They are puzzled, too, by the seeming impossibility of reconciling the voices heard in contention with the facts that no one was discovered upstairs but the assassinated Mademoiselle Espanier, and that there were no means of egress without the notice of the party ascending. The wild disorder of the room, the corpse thrust, with the head downward, up the chimney, the frightful mutilation of the body of the old lady, these considerations, with those just mentioned, and others which I need not mention, have sufficed to paralyze the powers, by putting completely at fault the boasted acumen of the government agents. They have fallen into the gross but common error of confounding the unusual with the abstruse. But it is by these deviations from the plane of the ordinary that reason feels its way, if at all, in its search for the true. In investigations such as we are now pursuing, it should not be so much asked, what has occurred as what has occurred that has never occurred before. In fact, the facility with which I shall arrive, or have arrived, at the solution of this mystery is in the direct ratio of its apparent insolubility in the eyes of the police. I stared at the speaker in mute astonishment. I am now awaiting, continued he, looking toward the door of our apartment. I am now awaiting a person who, although perhaps not the perpetrator of this butcheries, must have been in some measures implicated in their perpetration. Of the worst portion of the crimes committed, it is probable that he is innocent. I hope that I am right in this supposition, for upon it I build my expectation of reading the entire riddle. I look for the man here, in this room, every moment. It is true that he may not arrive, but the probability is that he will. Should he come, it will be necessary to detain him. Here are pistols, and we both know how to use them when occasion demands their use. End of the Murders in the Rue Morgue Part 1 Read by Christine in Oslo, Norway 18th of September 2011this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine in Oslo, Norway. The Works of Edgar Allan Poe. Raven Edition, Volume 1. The Murders in the Rue Morgue. Part 1. What song the sirens sang or what name Achilles assumed when he hid himself among women, although puzzling questions, are not beyond all conjecture. Sir Thomas Brown The mental features discoursed of as the analytical are, in themselves, but little susceptible of analysis. We appreciate them only in their efforts. We know of them, among other things, that they are always to their possessor, when inordinately possessed, a source of the liveliest enjoyment. As the strong man exults in his physical ability, delighting in such exercises as call his muscles into action, so glories the analyst in that moral activity which disentangles. He derives pleasure from even the most trivial occupations, bringing his talent into play. He is fond of enigmas, of conundrums, of hieroglyphics, exhibiting in his solutions of each a degree of acumen which appears to the ordinary apprehension 
prenatural. His results, brought about by the very soul and essence of method, have, in truth, the whole air of intuition. The faculty of resolution is possibly much invigorated by mathematical study, and especially by that highest branch of it which, unjustly and merely on account of its retrograde operations, has been called, as if par excellence, analysis. Yet to calculate is not in itself to analyze. A chess player, for example, does the one without effort at the other. It follows that the game of chess, in its effects upon mental character, is greatly misunderstood. I am not now writing a treatise, but simply prefacing a somewhat peculiar narrative by observations very much at random. I will, therefore, take occasion to assert that the higher powers of the reflective intellect are more decidedly and more usefully tasked by the unostentatious game of draught than by the elaborate frivolity of chess. In this latter, where the pieces have different and bizarre motions, with various and variable values, what is only complex is mistaken, a not unusual error, for what is profound. The attention is here called powerfully into play. If it flag for an instant, an oversight is committed resulting in injury or defeat. The possible moves being not only manifold but involute, the chances of such oversight are multiplied, and in nine cases out of ten, it is the more concentrative rather than the more acute player who conquers. In draft, on the contrary, where the moves are unique and have but little variation, the probabilities of inadvertence are diminished and a mere attention being left comparatively unemployed, what advantages are obtained by either party are obtained by superior acumen. To be less abstract, let us suppose a game of draft where the pieces are reduced to four kings, and where, of course, no oversight is to be expected. It is obvious that here the victory can be decided, the players being at all equal, only by some recherché movement the results of some strong exertion of the intellect. Deprived of ordinary resources, the analyst throws himself into the spirit of his opponent, identifies himself therewith, and not unfrequently sees thus, at a glance, the sole methods, sometimes indeed absurdly simple ones, by which he may seduce into error or hurry into miscalculation which has long been noted for its influence upon what is termed the calculating power, and men of the highest order of intellect have been known to take an apparently unaccountable delight in it, while eschewing chess as frivolous, 